It says we're live, folks. Can someone check and let me know if we're live? Live. I'm going to now go on Facebook and let them know we're live. I am live streaming my session. So please join us. Join us. Pray that our Lord, our risen Lord, will be glorified. All right. All right. All right. Here it goes. All right. Praise be the God, Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, I just want to say we love you. We praise you. We worship you, Father. We adore you, Father. We glorify you, Father, for who you are. You are the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We also praise you and worship you, glorify you, love you, cling to you, trust in you, depend on you. Because you are our all in all, we praise you and love you for who you are and what you've done for us. Your grace, your mercy, your love, your pity that we do not deserve. We love you, Babi. We love you, Abba. We love you, Avinu. We love your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We adore your son. We praise your son who's one with you. Your almighty, all pure, all holy, all loving, all beautiful son, the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> we love your Holy Spirit. We worship we adore your Holy Spirit. We depend on your Holy Spirit. We trust in your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Clothe us with your Holy Spirit. And Father, I also pray in the name of the Lord Jesus, you'll clothe our loved ones. In my case, my daughter is their mother. Clothe them with your Holy Spirit. Seal them with your Holy Spirit. Let your Holy Spirit just sanctify them, convict them, seal them, transform them, wash them, and purify them in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That the blood of Jesus will cover us, our loved ones. The blood of Jesus Christ that keeps us secure from Satan, that drives Satan to the pit of hell itself. That blood we plead upon us. Father, cleanse me in the blood of Jesus. Forgive me for my sins and give me the power to walk in the victory of the blood of Christ shed for me to save me from my sinfulness. To delight your heart, not grieve your spirit. And Father, anoint me to speak truth without error, to speak it clearly, to speak it passionately. Save me from stammering and confusion and bless your people who are listening now and will listen in the future. And please, Father, in your mercy and love, spread these videos wide and far to reach as many people that you're pleased to reach by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Christ. We depend on you. We need you. And keep us safe from the evil one, from all his attacks, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically, even financially, because we need you. We depend on you. And when we have you, we have everything we can possibly imagine. And even more than that, and we know you fight for us. And we have the victory in the blood of Christ. Thank you, Father. We love you. We love you, Lord Jesus. Son of God, increase in us. May I decrease. May we decrease. Be magnified. Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants. And fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, the Spirit of your Father. That Holy Spirit whom we love. We love you, Holy Spirit. Use me in my meager efforts. And bless the people here. Bless our loved ones. Please, Holy Spirit, bless my children and their mother. Be with them and keep them safe from the evil one. Please, Holy Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Everyone with me here? If you're with me, let me just post these links on my Facebook pages. All right. Now, I was asked a question, and I'm going to demonstrate the answer from the Holy Scriptures. Right? From the Holy Scriptures. So that you don't get my opinion, but we'll get God's word on the matter. Question was asked, since God is unchangeable, he's immutable. How can then Jesus be God when he took on an additional nature? He took upon himself a second nature, the nature of humanity, a human nature. Doesn't that prove that Jesus experienced a profound change? That was the question. Does everyone understand what the question is before I proceed to answer? Please, God's will, share that link. Okay. The question is, since God is unchangeable, he's immutable, does not change. By taking on a second nature, a human nature to himself, didn't the Lord Jesus Christ experience profound change? Profound change? If so, then how can he be God? Now, I've written an article on this, right? So I'm going to explain it on the live stream so that people can benefit. Because some people don't like to read. They prefer to listen. Or watched a response. So we'll do that. Number one, let me explain what it means for God being unchangeable. Let me first show you what it does not mean. Okay? 
it does not mean it does not mean that God cannot interact with his creatures. It does not mean that God is immobile, immovable. He doesn't interact or act, right? Because if that's the case, then anything God does would imply a change. For example, God spoke the universe into existence. Well, prior to him speaking the universe into existence, he didn't create, right? So does that assume because God went from not creating to creating, God changed? Let me repeat it again. Should we assume since God went from not creating to creating, God changed? Should we assume that prior to the creation of sentient beings where God could speak with and have fellowship with, prior to that moment, he wasn't having fellowship with anyone outside his own being. And then he went to start having fellowship with sentient beings outside of his own being. Isn't that a change? Well, see, that's the wrong definition of change. Change does not mean God cannot act or interact and can't do something that he wasn't doing prior to that moment when he chose to perform that action. Is everyone with me there? Do you understand what changing and not changing means? God being unchangeable does not mean that he cannot go from not doing something to doing something. Whether performing an action that he didn't perform or whether interacting with creatures that he brought into being. That's not the definition of immutability. That's not how the Bible defines God's unchangeableness. So then what does it mean for God to be unchanging? It simply means this. That God in his essential attributes, in his divine nature and essence, those attributes remain constant and the same remain infinite there is no increase or decrease to any of his attributes no matter what god does even taking on a nature of a man that nature those actions he performs that interaction does not affect any of his essential attributes so god is still all powerful he's not more powerful one day than the other or less powerful <clears throat> the next day than he was the day prior god is all wise Perfect in his wisdom, understanding that those attributes remain constant, they remain optimal, they remain in all their perfections, and do not increase or decrease and are not affected by anything that God does in creation. Is that clear? Do you understand? The biblical definition of being unchangeable. For those of you who are alert and attentive, and I hope God will use me to bless you to know your God more. Love him more passionately, live for him, and understand his word. And I pray that for all of us. So is that definition clear? What it means for God to be unchangeable and what it doesn't mean, right? What it doesn't mean. It does not mean that God cannot interact, cannot interact with his creatures. It does not mean that God cannot perform an action, an action that he wasn't engaged in prior to the moment that engage in that action, it does not mean that he cannot assume an additional nature. It simply means that in his essential attributes, in his divine attributes, those attributes remain optimal, constant, consistent, and infinite in all their perfections, and nothing that God does affects those attributes. He doesn't become more powerful or less powerful, more wise or less wise, et cetera, et cetera, right? Right? So I want to make sure you got the definition because I'm going to give you the proof. Okay. Now let me give you the proof that the Bible teaches Jesus, because he's God, is unchangeable, immutable in regards to his divine essence. But he took on a second nature, the nature of a human creature. And in that nature, he experienced changes as all human beings do. But those changes that he experienced as a man had no effect on his essential divine attributes because as God, he still possessed all those attributes and all their perfection. Can I now prove that from Scripture? Do you want the proof? Okay. Let's go to Hebrews 1, 8 to 12. Hebrews 1, 8 to 12. Let's see. Let me prove what I just said. The Bible affirms both that as God, Christ's, 
essential divine attributes remain constant, unchangeable, and he possesses them in all their perfections. As man, he experienced genuine human changes over time because he wouldn't be truly human if he did not change. Because to be human is to change. To be part of creation is to change. You can't be part of creation and not experience changes. So if he's truly human, then he experienced genuine changes in regards to his human nature. Changes that had no effect on the possession of his divine attributes. Right? Now here's the proof. Hebrews 1, 8-12. Hebrews 1, 8 to 12. Thank our brother first and last for posting. Let's read. But unto the Son, he saith, God the Father says to the Son, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellow. So the Father is speaking about the Son and to the Son, right? And notice the Father praises and glorifies and magnifies the Son as the eternal reigning God. Now watch here, Hebrews 1, 10 to 12. Notice what else the Father says to the Son and about the Son, citing a psalm of David, a psalm that speaks to God being the unchangeable, eternal creator and sustainer of all creation. Now let's read. And thou, Lord, this is the Father speaking according to Hebrews. And the Lord hears the Son. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the work of thine hand. So the Father says to Jesus, you are the Lord who at the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. And the Father says to Jesus, his Son, you made the heavens by your own hands, by your own power. They shall perish, but thou remainest. Did you catch it? The Father says about the Son, unlike the creation you made, my Son, you remain. And they shall all wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture, a robe, shalt thou, you, fold them up. They shall be changed. But thou, Son, art the same, and thy ear shall not fail. Did you catch it? The Father says to the Son, You, Son, are Lord, Yahweh. You, Son, laid the foundations of the earth. You, Son, created the heavens, made the heavens by your own hands, by your own power. You, Son, remain the same. Unlike creation, which grows old, and you roll them up like a robe, your years never end, and you are the same. Does everyone see that? Now, what makes this passage interesting is that it is a citation, as grace, grace and apostleship noted, from Psalm 102, 25, 27. Let's see what psalm the Father quotes in respect to the Son and praising the Son. First and last, post Psalm 102, verse 1, verse 12, and 24 to 27. Psalm 102, verse 1, verse 12, and verses 24 to 27. The Father takes the words of the psalm, praising Jehovah as the almighty, unchangeable creator and sustainer of the entire creation, and applies it to the Son to glorify the Son. Right? Psalm 102, verse 1, verse 12, verses 24 to 27. We lost first and last. He bailed out on us. I don't know what happened. Let's see what happens. All right. He's gone, guys. Wake up. He's gone. We're waiting. Sorry for the delay on, on live stream. Okay. Here it goes again. Psalm 102, verse 1, verse 12, and verses 24 to 27. A prayer of the afflicted when he is overwhelmed and pours out his complaint before the Lord, Yahweh. Hear my prayer, O Lord, O Yahweh, and let my cry come unto thee. Notice Psalm 102, 12. But thou, O Lord, O Yahweh, shalt endure forever, and thy remembrance unto all generations. So Yahweh, you will endure forever. Now notice the psalm that the Father quoted in regards to the Son in Hebrews 1, 10 and 12. Notice, I said, O my God, take me not away in the midst of my days. Thy years are throughout all generations. 
Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth. Sound familiar? This is what was quoted in Hebrews 1, 10 to 12. Here it's about Jehovah Almighty. But in Hebrews 1, 10 to 12, it's the Father saying these words to the Son. Identifying the Son as Jehovah Almighty, the unchanging, unchangeable creator, sustainer of all creation. Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy ears, thy ears shall have no end. Do you see what Hebrews did? The author of Hebrews, Paul, perhaps using a secretary, an amanuensis, maybe even Luke, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has the Father, quoting Psalm 102, 25, 27, and praise of the Son. The Father says to the Son, You are that Lord Yahweh, Jehovah, who laid the foundation of the earth. You created the heavens by your own hands. You remain the same. Your ears shall never end, unlike creation that's changing, growing old, which you roll up. Okay. Now, can I ask you a question? Didn't Jesus, as a human being, grow, change over time? Yeah, but Psalm 45, 6 to 7. I know you're excited, Grace. I love you, brother. So in what sense could Jesus be said to remain the same, never changing, and his years never ending? In what sense? In regards to his human nature, what did change, which do, did grow old and die and then was raised immortal, or in regards to his deity as the divine creator sustainer of all creation in regards to his deity he remains the same and never changes so did you see that mm as god he is unchangeable but that doesn't mean he's immobile immovable that god became flesh but by becoming flesh it did not change any of his essential attributes his attributes remain the same constant and infinite right From getting it now that same Hebrews that just told you that Christ is Jehovah God the Almighty unchangeable creator and sustainer of all creation tells you that Jesus did change did grow and became something he wasn't let's go to Hebrews 5 8 to 9 let me show you that Hebrews 5 8 to 9 though he were a son Yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Wow, Christ had to learn something. He learned what it's like to remain faithful to God, even though his obedience resulted in suffering because of it. So he learned something new. Remaining faithful and constant in spite of suffering because of his faithfulness. Well, for him to learn something new means he changed. But then notice verse 9. And being made perfect, he became perfect. Hmm. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Notice the same author in chapter 1 says that Jesus is Jehovah God Almighty who never changes, remains the same, his years never end. But then in chapter 5 he says Christ learned something new, which means he acquired experiential knowledge that he did not have prior to that experience, that process, and became perfect. How can Jesus who is already perfect become perfect? What is the author of Hebrews saying? In what sense did Jesus become perfect? In his human life, in his human nature, in his human experience. Do you see it? As a man, in his human life, his human nature, he grew, he changed, he learned. In fact, if he didn't grow, if he didn't change, if he didn't learn, then he's not truly human. Which human being doesn't grow, doesn't change, doesn't learn? Jesus became an actual flesh and blood human being. He was a man in every sense of the term with the exception of sin. But if Jesus did not grow, did not learn, did not change, then he's not truly human. It was a phantom body. 
So we become Gnostics or Docetists. So notice Hebrews affirms both, right? As God, he remains the same. He never changes. His years never end. But as man, being truly human, he learned, he grew, he changed. Right? In fact, remember what Hebrews 1, 10 to 12 says. Let's post it again. Hebrews 1, 10 to 12. Hebrews 1, 10 to 12. One, let's look at it. Well, now pay attention to creation in contrast to Christ. Let's read it. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they sh all shall wax old as doth a garment. Did you catch it? Creation by its very nature is perishing. It's growing old. It's withering. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. Now, can I ask you a question? If human beings are part of this creation, a creation that's growing old, that's withering, that's wearing out, that's changing, does it surprise you that because we're part of this creation, we grow old, we perish, we wither, we change? We wouldn't be truly human and truly part of creation if we didn't grow old and perish and wither, right? But now, here's the other question. If Jesus entered creation to become a human being, and that human nature is part of this creation that perishes, that withers, that grows old, how could Jesus not grow old, not wither, and not change in regards to his human nature if he's truly part of creation from that moment onwards? Is it clear? Does it make sense before I move on to the next point? Now let's go to Luke 2, verse 40 and 52. Luke 2, 40 and verse 52. Luke chapter 2, verse 40 and 52. Right? And the child grew. Which child doesn't grow unless he dies or she dies? And waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. So my question is, if Jesus is truly a human being, born as a human baby, became a human child, then became a human teen and a human adult, how could he not grow if he's truly human? How can he as a child not grow up to adulthood? How can he as a child not increase in human wisdom and stature? And as he remained faithful to God, how could God's favor not increase upon him as he matures into moral perfection? You catch it? So it's only logical and reasonable to assume that if Jesus is truly human and being human makes him part of creation and creation is perishing, growing old and withering, that he as a man would also grow would also change, would also wither until he died and then raised that human body, that human nature, and made it immortal. Right? So I hope that answered your question, MM. Where's the difficulty? Is there a difficulty? Or if we understand what the Bible teaches about God being unchangeable and about the nature of creation. What we just saw makes perfect sense. Everything good, God's will not mind, is from the triune God. So he gets the glory. So is it clear to everyone? That doesn't mean this is something you're going to fully comprehend. But it's something that the Bible teaches. Notice Hebrews teaches both. As God, he remains the same, never changes. But because also he became man, he grew. He learned. He became perfect. In regards to his human life is human experience is human existence clear right if that's clear we can move on to another issue another point just give you a chance to think if you have a follow-up question let me know if that made sense we can move on to another issue anyone need clarification or that made sense you want to make sure glory to god and help me to help you please 
as much as you can, respond to my questions. That way, I'll get a sense whether you're understanding or I'm confusing you. All right. Well, if you don't have any other questions, there is a video clip from Pastor Steve Anderson, Stephen Anderson, from Faithful Word Baptist Church in Arizona. I'd like to address some of his arguments. Are you guys, unless you have a question. Yeah, he's become very famous or infamous, depending on who you, you ask. Uh, he's talking about why you shouldn't call Mary the mother of God. Uh, his arguments weren't too good. So I wanted to tackle those arguments for the benefit of us Protestants, right? Should we, should we be afraid of calling her the mother of God, provided we define what it means and what it doesn't mean? Okay, so should I tackle that video or no? Yeah, that's that's a you're asking me a very difficult topic, Pitar. Uh, Hi, Vay. That topic is very difficult, and it's a huge topic. And I have a lot of scripture and the weight of church history against me. We'll see uh, if the Spirit leads me. I will. Okay, let's do it. Here it is. What Mary is not the mother of God. My response to Pastor Stephen and in the Orthodox Church, L. They Anderson. Think right. I think his church is in. Oh, it's in Tempe. Is it Tempe? Yeah, Tempe, Arizona. Here's the clip. Stephen L. Anderson. Very famous or infamous, depend on who you ask. Yep, Tempe, Arizona. I was going to say Tucson, but he's not there. All right. Let me just play it. Let's play it, my friend. Till then. Darling, please wait for me. Should not give up my day job. All right. Let's play it. And in the Orthodox Church, they say that Mary is the mother of God. Let's see if that's biblical. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Let's hear this argument. Now, notice the words without mother, okay? And obviously we're talking about without earthly father, without earthly mother, in the sense that he's the Son of God. Now, if you would... Go to Mark. Okay. Here again, I do appreciate a lot of what he has to say and his boldness, but I also pray that God will grant him the grace to change a lot of his erroneous doctrines, some of which are heretical, and softens his heart towards some of the groups that he just goes after viciously, right? Unmercifully. Unmerc do you see his argument? He quoted Hebrews 7, 3. Let's look at it. Let's take his arguments point by point. And again, I want us to be as biblical as possible. So if Roman Catholicism or the Orthodox Church affirms something that happens to be biblical, we should not hesitate to embrace it because all truth is God's truth no matter where it comes from, right? All truth is God's truth, and God is truth, and he wants us to affirm all his truth for his glory. Now, Notice the argument. He says, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. So he's saying, you see, in regards to his divine nature, in regards to his deity, Christ has no mother or father, right? Earthly father or mother. He emphasized earthly father mother. Now, I don't know of any Roman Catholic or Orthodox who would disagree that as far as Jesus' deity is concerned, there is no earthly father or earthly mother right that generated his divine nature no roman catholic nor orthodox believes that jesus's divine nature was begotten by or of an earthly father or earthly mother no roman catholic or orthodox thinks that mary is the mother of christ in respect to his deity they do not believe that she's the mother in that she generated the divine nature of christ they say his divine nature originates from the father the father is the source of jesus's deity in this eternal relationship as mary is the source of his human nature right everyone with me there do you understand so to use this passage to refute what they believe shows that you're misrepresenting what they believe or you're ignorant of their belief when they call mary the mother of god they mean that the child who was conceived in her blessed womb in the power of the Holy Spirit, right? As a virgin, that child was still fully, essentially God, who was taking his human nature and physical body from his mother. 
They're not saying she's the mother of God in respect to his deity that she generated his divine nature. So this is not a good argument, folks. If you're going to refute what someone believes, represent their belief correctly and present proper biblical arguments to show why they're wrong. Right? It's not a good argument. Is that clear? His second argument is going to backfire against him. His second argument is going to backfire against him. Notice the argument he uses. Chapter number 12. Mark chapter number 12. Okay? Because what I want to point out to you is that although Jesus Christ is God, and although Mary was the mother of Jesus, humanly speaking, that does not make Mary the mother of God. See, this is a faulty logic. They take these extra steps. Instead of just believing what the Bible tells us, because you can't find a verse that says Mary's the mother of God. Nor can you find a verse that says God is a trinity. Nor can you find a verse that Jesus that says Jesus is the God man. Right? I mean, anyway, you get Show me that verse in the Bible. That's man's logic. Man's logic says, well, Mary's the mother of Jesus, and Jesus is God, ergo. Mary is the mother of God. Yeah. And that is not correct logic. Why not? That's man's That's... wisdom. But there's no verse that says that. Everything we believe should be based on Bible verse. Now watch. He's not going to provide the biblical proof that he's wrong. It's in the Bible. Notice what he said. There is no biblical proof for coming to that conclusion. A, Mary's the mother of Jesus. B, Jesus is God. C, therefore... Mary's the mother of God. He says, this is not logical because there's no biblical support for him for it. Guys, watch how he now provides the biblical support for it. He's going to provide proof that the Bible does call Mary the mother of God. In fact, the mother of our God. Watch. Not just man's reasoning. But let's see if that logic holds up. Look at Mark 12, human verse nature 35. In this physical body. Yes, and Jesus body. answered and said, well, he taught in the temple. How say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore himself calleth him Lord. And whence is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. So what's Jesus saying here? That David is not the father of God is what he's saying. Isn't that what he's saying here? He's saying, look, the scribes are saying that Christ is son of David, but he's saying, wait a minute, David calls Christ Lord. See, they thought Christ was just going to be a human being. A lot of the Jews and even the Jews that you talk to today when they're looking for the Messiah, they think of it as just a human being who's going to live and die, and he's just a mortal man that God used. And Jesus is trying to teach them, no, no, no. David calls Christ Lord. He's not just a son of David. No, no, no. He's the Lord of David. He's the God of him. So in the sense that he's the son of God and the Lord of the universe, he's not the son of David in that sense. He's only the son of David physically speaking. Okay. In the sense that he physically descended from David on his human side because he's the son of man and he's the son of God. But to sit there and make this jump that says, well, Mary's the mother of God. Then you'd have to say, well, David's the father of God. David's the father of God, but that's false, and he proves it false right in the scripture that you just looked at. Okay, let me see if he says something else. Go if you would to Matthew chapter 12. That was Okay, now let me show you how his argument backfired against him. Let's go to Mark 12, 35, 37. If you guys are paying careful attention, he just established that the Bible calls Mary, the blessed mother of our Lord Jesus, the mother of our God. Let's see if you caught it. Christian princess, you with me too? Okay, let's read. And Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple, How say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Spirit inspired, made known, revealed to David the following fact about the Messiah. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore himself calleth him Lord, whence he is he then his son. The common people heard him gladly. Now notice how he understood this passage. By calling Jesus my Lord, identifying him as Lord, David was calling Jesus my God. David was addressing Jesus as God when he called him Lord, right? You understand his logic? Lord here means God. 
So when David says, my Lord, he means the Messiah, Christ, Jesus, is his God. David was basically saying, my God. Don't forget, according to him, my Lord equates to my God. Lord equates to God. And so David was saying, that as far as Jesus' deity is concerned, he's not my son. It's only in his humanity that he's my son. No Roman Catholic or Orthodox would argue against that point. As far as Jesus' deity is concerned, his divine nature, Mary's not his mother because she didn't generate his divine nature. She's his mother insofar that she gave to him his physical body and human nature. They'll say amen. We don't disagree with you. But you guys want to see how he just proved that the Bible calls Jesus, Jesus' mother, I should say, his blessed mother, conceived him by the power of the Holy Spirit and gave birth to him without sexual intercourse. You want to see how he just proved that the Bible calls Mary the mother of our God? You guys ready for the evidence? Okay, let me repeat his argument. By calling Jesus my Lord, David was pretty much calling him my God. By identifying Jesus the Christ as Lord, David was identifying Jesus the Christ as God because the Spirit revealed that to him. Luke 1, 43. Yep, she knew where I was going with this. Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, sees Mary, who had just conceived the Lord in her blessed womb, and whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Thank you, Stephen Anderson, for proving that the Bible does call Mary the mother of our God. You catch it? Do you see it? Now, lest he says or argues that Elizabeth wasn't inspired by the Spirit to say this, let's read Luke 1, 41 to 45. Luke 1, 41 to 45. So you see how his argument backfired against him? And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe. Now, John was only six months old in his mother's womb at this time. When the babe John in his mother's womb heard the sound of Mary's voice, he le leapt in his mother's womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. By the way. Part of the Hail Mary comes from Luke 142, Luke 128. Hail Mary, full of grace. That's Luke 128. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. That's Luke 142. Right? Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. So part of it comes from Luke. Okay, now let's read. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Can you guys catch it? Everyone catch it? Was Elizabeth filled with the Holy Spirit to call Mary the mother of my Lord? Yes. According to Stephen Anderson, to call Jesus my Lord, as David did by the Holy Spirit, is the same as identifying him as God, right? That's what he just said, correct? So according to his own logic and interpretation, isn't this proof from the Holy Scriptures that Mary's called the mother of God, the mother of our God, the mother of my God, Jesus Christ? Because though she didn't generate the divine nature of Christ, by giving him his human nature and physical body and carrying him in her blessed womb, she truly was the mother of God who now became in flesh. So you're just proving that God has brothers. Thank you, Christian princess. How are you refuting me? So James is not the brother of God? So Jesus isn't God who became his brother? Grace. You're making an argument undermines the deity of Christ. Keep it up. Great work. So then why do you believe Jesus is God? Christian princess, you may not. Why don't Why don't you? That's your inconsistency. You're only exposing your inconsistency. If 
James is the brother of Christ, who is God in the flesh. That means God became James' brother. So in a sense, he is the brother of God. So you're inconsistent. That's your problem. So why are you being inconsistent? Grace and apostleship. In what sense was Christ the mother? I'm sorry, the, the Lord of Elizabeth. Now, I don't know why I'm debating you, Grace. I think you're getting excited and you want to just challenge the assertion. Are you Stephen Anderson? Because I thought I'm refuting Stephen Anderson. So if Stephen Anderson says, my Lord means God, why would you then tell me maybe Lord doesn't mean that? I'm just curious. I'm just trying to see what you're trying to prove right now. Am I refuting your argument or am I refuting his claim, his assertion showing his inconsistency? Now, Abraham was Sarah's Lord because Abraham was her husband. In one sense, in, one, in what sense is the unborn child who has just been recently conceived in his mother's womb, the mother of Elizabeth? Now, I'm going to let you answer and refute yourself. No, you didn't have no rebuttal. Your rebuttal is a false analogy. And I got to be honest, as a brother who loves you, you're arguing like a Mohammedan. It's a silly objection. Abraham isn't called Lord just by anyone. He's called Lord by his wife and his servants. Now that makes sense because being the owner of the servant, Eliezer, Abraham is his master. So he's the Lord in the sense of his master. And being the husband of Sarah, he is her head. So he is her Lord. So in what sense, in what sense is Jesus the unborn child, Elizabeth's Lord? That's what I'm trying to say. Now answer your own objection. Why is she calling him Lord? In what sense would she identify him as her Lord, a babe who has just been conceived in his mother's womb? He's probably a few days old at this time. So answer that to me. Your analogies are false analogies. These are arguments that Muslims, Jehovah's Witnesses use against me. I even have a written response to that. So I don't know what you're trying to prove by saying, well, Abraham is Lord, really, in the same sense that Jesus is? Okay, so now you have four members of the Godhead. Why don't you start burning incense to Abraham? You get my point? Right? Grace, you with me there or no? She's making sure. So now, please answer the question so I can move on to the rest of the, the video. In, one se in, in what sense is Jesus Elizabeth's Lord? He wasn't her husband. Okay. What, in what sense? That's okay, Grace. I'm trying to now help you answer that objection. Help him out if you guys want to. Okay. Now, as the Messiah... In what sense would he, as the Messiah, be her Lord? Be her Lord. In what sense? In what sense? Okay, only as her master, Chris, you sure? Are you ready to become a Jehovah Witness, sir? You'd make a great Jehovah Witness with your arguments. I'm really proud of you. Only her master, that's it? Are you sure? That's it? Messiah, king, and therefore he's her lord and that he's her king and ruler? That's all she knew? You sure about that? Okay. So in what sense did Elizabeth identify Christ as her lord? Only as her master. That's it? That's it. I'm going to have to now, I guess I'm going to have to now show that by the Holy Spirit filling her, and her son, and her husband, she would have known, according to the prophetic witness, that this child is God in the flesh. Can I now prove that? Because it turns out to be an objection. I didn't think I needed to prove it, but I think I'm going to need to prove it. Can I prove to you that they would have known by the Spirit filling them in accord with the prophetic witness that this child is the mighty God in the flesh? Can I prove that to you? You guys want the evidence now? So that when Elizabeth says the Lord Jesus is my Lord, she meant, means in my, you know in the sense of being my God. How many of you guys want the evidence for this? Huh? 
Anybody? All right. First, let me prove to you they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Zechariah, Elizabeth, and John from the womb filled the Holy Spirit. Luke 1 15. Luke 1 15. Yeah, first, last, I'll get to that in a minute. Yep, you have the idea, the notion in mind. Okay. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. So John was filled with the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, in his mother's womb. Luke 141. Let's see. Luke 141. Let's see here. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation, salutation of Mary the babe, I'm sorry. When it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Luke 167. Luke 167. What about Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist? When John was born and his mouth was open so he could speak, what does it say? Luke 167. Luke 167. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Okay, now, I'm going to come back to Luke 167 in a minute. But it's here, here's what I want you to see. Let's go to Isaiah 9, 1 and 2, and 6 and 7. Now, let me show you that the Holy Spirit filled Zechariah, Elizabeth, and John, and also, by filling Zechariah and Elizabeth, made known to them, that the child to be born from Mary is actually God in the flesh. Let me prove it to you. Okay? Isaiah 9, 1 and 2, 6 to 7. Let's see if you catch it. Isaiah 9, verses 1 and 2, 6 to 7. Read with me. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation. When at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. Notice Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them hath the light shine. Remember verse 2. Remember the language. Please pay attention carefully by the grace of God's spirit. Especially you Christian princess and Fatar, because you're going to use this now in the future. That people that walk in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shone. shine. Darkness, great light, those in the land of the shadow of death, light has shined on them. What's this light that will shine forth from Galilee of the nations? 6 and 7 tells us. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be... Be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, Il Gibor, a title of God, of Jehovah, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Pay attention to this. This is the part I want you to remember. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Amen. So pay attention. Great light. People dwelling in darkness. In the land of the shadow of death. Light has shined on them. A child born who is a son. That is the mighty God. Il Gibor. A title of Jehovah. Right? Who sits on the throne of David to rule it forever. Remember that. Now, if you remember all this, let's go back to Zechariah. Luke 1, 67 to 79. Let's see if you make the connection. Right? Luke 1, 67 to 79. It's long, but pay attention. David and his throne. People dwelling in darkness in the land of the shadow of death. Light has shined on them. Let's see if you see how much Zechariah knew being filled with the Holy Spirit. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied. So the Spirit now inspires Zechariah to prophesy, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. So notice, Zechariah knows that as he speaks, 
a horn, a king bringing salvation has been born to the house of David. And he's speaking about Mary and her son. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets. So he's aware of the prophetic witness because he's mentioning their prophecies, right? Which have been since the world began. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath which he sware to our father Abraham. Watch. That he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. In holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Now here's where it gets juicy. Pay attention from 76. And thou, child. Speaking to John, his son, shall be called the prophet of the highest. For thou shalt go before, you're going to go ahead of the Lord to prepare his ways. To give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Why? Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness. And in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Who caught it? Who caught it? Anyone catch it? Who caught the allusion to Isaiah 9 in the words of Zechariah as he prophesies about John the Baptist? M.M., did you catch it? Who caught it? I don't know if I'm, I think I'm going to sleep. Show it to me. You didn't catch it? Go read Luke 1, 79 again. Show it to me. Zechariah said, you, John, my son, the Baptist, right? We're going to go ahead of the Lord, before the Lord, because the day spring has come on high to visit us. The day spring who gives light to them that sit in darkness and the shadow of death. Now let's go to Isaiah 9, 1 or 2. Let's see if you catch it now. Okay. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation. When at the first he lightly, lightly afflicted the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali. And afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations. The people that walk in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them hath light shine. Now put Luke 179 right afterwards. Luke 179. Did you catch it now, Shawarma? To give to them that sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Okay. Is it clear that Zechariah realizes that Jesus Christ is the child of Isaiah 9, who was born to give light to those who dwell in darkness in the land of the shadow of death, so that John the Baptist is sent to prepare for the child who fulfills Isaiah 9. So was Zechariah aware of the prophecy of Isaiah 9? Do you guys see it or no? Hold on. Isn't that the same prophecy that says the child born is the mighty God, Il Gibor, the very name of Jehovah God in Isaiah 10, 20 to 21? So you're telling me Zechariah, filled with the Spirit, would not know that the child born, whom his son John was sent to prepare the way for, isn't God in the flesh? And Elizabeth wouldn't have known that? Can you help me out? So how much more evidence do you need that Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, knew that the Messiah was her Lord in the sense of being her God. So Stephen Anderson got that right. Is that clear or no? Yep. 
He's actually quoting God's will, not mine. Malachi 4.2, when he says, the day spring on high, he's actually alluding to Malachi 4.2, which is part of Malachi 4, 5 to 6. Yeah, he's the only one announced to come ahead of Christ. Yeah. Now, let's show another thing that Zechariah says as he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke 176. I don't think you guys caught this. Luke 176. But are you with me or you went to sleep, bro? Luke 176. The King James Version, we fishy. So so films. I just read your comment. Glory to Jesus Christ that God has moved you to use my materials, and I'm honored that the Lord would be pleased to do that. Can you tell me how effective my materials have have been? As you dismantle the Dawah team, are they very effective? Let me know, brother. Okay. Okay. Luke 1, 76. Watch here. Let's read. Notice Luke 1, 76. Zechariah says about John. Watch here. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. John the Baptist is going to go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. Now, John the Baptist went before whose face? Whose face did John the Baptist go ahead of to prepare for his coming? Jesus, right? But hold on. Zechariah says he's going before the face of the Lord. He's referring to Malachi 3.1. No, no, not Isaiah 40 verse 3. No, 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 no. You're wrong, Grace. Malachi 3 verse 1. That's what he's referring to. Now let's see Malachi 3.1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Actually, the Hebrew says, before my face. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Zechariah, filled with the Spirit, was alluding to Malachi 3.1, where God says, a messenger will be sent to prepare the way before the face of the Lord. Here the word Lord is Ha-Adan. The phrase Ha-Adan, the Lord, is never used for anyone but Yahweh God Almighty. So this messenger is being sent to prepare for the coming of Yahweh, the Lord. Further proof that it's Yahweh Jehovah that the messenger is preparing, preparing for, it says when the Lord comes, he'll come to his temple. We know the temple was not built for man, but for Jehovah God. So John the Baptist was sent to prepare for the face of the Lord of Malachi 3.1, the Lord, who in that passage is Jehovah, who comes to his temple. But wait, John the Baptist was sent to prepare for Christ. Luke 3, 15 to 17. So, so, glory to Jesus that my materials are helping you to destroy the Dalit team. Really? You bless my heart. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for just building me up. I love you, Lord Jesus, and I know I will have victory the life of my family no doubt about it lord you are fighting thank you brother okay now luke 3 15 17 john the baptist was sent to prepare for who and as the people were in expectation and all men used in their hearts of john whether he were the christ or not john answered saying unto them all i indeed baptize you with water but one mightier than i cometh the latchet of whose shoes i'm not worthy to unloose i'm not good enough to be a servant he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will truly purge, a thorough, complete purging, his floor, and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. Now, John is saying, I'm not the Christ. I came to prepare for him. Since Luke wrote Luke, let's see what he says in Acts 19.4. Luke wrote Luke, let's see what he says in Acts 19.4. Right? No, Luke wrote Luke. Let's see what he wrote in Acts 19.4. Then said Paul, John, verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, 
that they should believe on him who it should come after him that is on Christ Jesus did you catch it John the Baptist came ahead of the face of Christ to prepare people for the Christ the Christ but Zechariah filled with the Holy Spirit says in Luke 1 76 my son will go ahead to prepare for the face of the Lord to prepare for his coming his ways right now although I said grace and apostleship was wrong to cite Isaiah 40 let me qualify that you're not entirely incorrect because there is an allusion to Isaiah 40 verse 3 and the last part where it says to prepare his ways that is an allusion to Isaiah 40 verse 3 so technically you are right but more specifically by referring to John as the one going before the face of the Lord that's Malachi 3 1 so here Zechariah is actually combining both Isaiah 40 and Malachi 3 1 together so my apologies for jumping the gun there so yes you are right in that the last part of Isaiah 40 verse 3 where it says to prepare his ways that is an allusion to Isaiah 43 even though it's being combined with an allusion to Malachi 3 1 the messenger of Malachi 3 1 and the voice of Isaiah 40 verse 3 is John the Baptist but both prophecies say that voice who is John the Baptist that messenger sent to prepare for the face of the Lord right both prophecies say that messenger that voice is preparing for the coming of God Almighty not a creature and here Isaiah 40 verse 3 the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness that John the Baptist prepare ye the way of the Lord Jehovah make straight in the desert a highway for our God the way of the Lord Jehovah ends up becoming the ways of the Lord Jesus Christ preparing a highway for our God ends up being a highway being prepared for Jesus Christ because that's the Lord that John went ahead of to prepare for his ways you're right you with me there did you get it before I move on but did you remember the other part of Isaiah 9 where it says a great light who sits on the throne of David a light that shines from Galilee of the Gentiles now let's go to Luke 1 26 to 32 Luke 1 26 to 32 so how much did Elizabeth Zechariah knew being filled with the Holy Spirit they knew enough they knew enough to know that the child that Mary conceived was going to give birth to is the child of Isaiah 9 Malachi 3 Isaiah 40 the mighty God being born as a babe to sit on David's throne who is the great light shining in the darkness to, to redeem and ransom the people living in the shadow of death who is Isaiah's God and Israel's God the Lord whom the voice in the wilderness would prepare the ways of Ha'adon the Lord of Malachi 3 1 was coming to the temple after the messenger John the Baptist prepared for his coming okay how about now Okay, well, that's not my fault. La, 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 la. All right, is it clear? You better make sure it's a lot better, you sinner. Thank you, we fishy. Everything goes from the Lord. Okay, so let's read Luke 1 26 to 32. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee. Remember Isaiah 9? God will honor Galilee of the nations. Is it a coincidence that Mary and Joseph live in a town in Galilee, Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this would should be. <clears throat> And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Notice now the allusion to Isaiah 9, 6-7. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, 
and bring forth a son. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and shall call his name Jesus. Now notice an allusion to Isaiah 9-2. He shall be great. A great light has shined. He shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest. A son is given. And who is the Son? The Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. For what reason? Verse 33. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And 33 says why? And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now compare that with Isaiah 9, 7. Isaiah 9, 7. Right? I gotta kill this sucker. Now let's read Isaiah 9 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, that's Luke 1 32 33, and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. What more evidence do you guys need to see that according to Luke 1, the Holy Spirit filled Zechariah and Elizabeth and Gabriel announced to Mary that the child to be born from her is the great light that would shine from Galilee of the nations the child to be born who's a son given who's the mighty God sitting on David's throne forever who is the Lord our God of Isaiah 40 verse 3 and the Lord who is coming to his temple in Malachi 3 verse 1 Is it clear to everyone who's listening? Is it clear to everyone who's listening? The proof is sufficient, right? Okay. Now let's go back to look at Luke 143. Luke 143. What about you, Christian Prince? Princess? Christian Prince. I don't mean to insult you. Do you see the proof is clear? That the Spirit revealed to Zechariah and Elizabeth, Jesus is their Lord in the sense of being their God. So when Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, says, And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? In what sense did she know that the Messiah child, this baby conceived in Mary's womb, was her Lord? Only as her master, who ruler her king, or more than that? <clears throat> more than that. How much did she know in light of the evidence? He is her Lord in the sense of, like Stephen Anderson said, her God. And she knew this. So if, G if Mary is the mother of Elizabeth's Lord, and Elizabeth knew that he was her Lord in the sense of being her God, there you have it. Mary is the mother of our God in respect in regards to his human nature. Everyone got this point or no? Any person here confused, not convinced, needs more clarification, this is your time to ask me to clarify. If not, because I want to go to the rest of Stephen Anderson's video. Nobody? That's per that's assuming you're all listening, right? MM, I think MM went to sleep. Batar, Shaurma, Spada, first and last, God's you guys all got this? Okay. If y'all got it, let's continue. Y'all, let's continue with the rebuttal. Mark 12, go to Matthew 12. So although Jesus is God, and although Mary is the mother of Jesus, you're using faulty logic here. No, we're not. Because we're using she your is logic. only the mother of Jesus, humanly speaking. Because Jesus, as God, existed before Mary was ever born. So she's not the mother of God. She's the mother of... And which Roman Catholic or Orthodox would object to anything he just said? Of course, Jesus is eternal. And he created Mary and chose her to be his mother. Of course, she did not generate his divine nature. So this, again, may convince those Protestants and his followers who don't want to actually understand what Roman Catholics or the Orthodox mean or what church history meant when they said Mary's the mother of God. But it's not, gonna, it's not going to be convincing to those who know better. 
of Jesus only in an earthly sense, and taking that logical leap to calling her the mother of God is false doctrine and heresy. And not only that, but to, to venerate Mary is completely unscriptural. Look what the Bible says in Matthew 12, verse 47. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. So is Jesus putting great emphasis on his mother, Mary? He points at a random woman. He points at a random woman and said, This is my mother. Now I'm going to address this objection. I'm going to address it in a minute. Notice what he's saying. In, Luke, in Matthew 12, 47, our Lord says, My mother, brothers, sisters are those who do the will of, of my father. He didn't quote the rest of it, right? If you quote the rest of it first and last, he says, those who do the will of my father. So don't forget it, right? Right? Notice verse 49. And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. Verse 50. For whosoever shall do the will of my father, which is in heaven, the same as my brother, sister, and mother. Now, I'm going to show you how this is going to backfire against Stephen Anderson and others, our Protestant brethren, because we're Protestants. because We affirm sola scriptura sola fide. Because we don't hear the other side. So notice, Jesus said, if you do the will of my father, you're my mother, my brother, right? Okay? Don't forget that. Because he's going to mention Luke 11, 27, 28. So let's hear his argument and show you how it backfires against him. Okay? Just wait and see. Okay, let's, let's go on. Now, does that put great emphasis on Mary? That we should venerate her, enshrine her, have pictures of her, bow down to pictures of her, pray to her? No. They try to say, oh, your mother wants to talk to you. He's like, no, this is my mother. He points at every female follower who is doing his word and says, behold, my mother and my brethren. They also teach that Mary remained a virgin forever. Tough luck for Joseph. He thinks he's, you know, he thinks he's getting married. It's like, no, 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 no. Yeah, you I be mean, celibate. No, here I, I agree with him. I know some Catholics Orthodox may get offended, but I have to be faithful to Scripture. I do agree that the biblical evidence is clear that after the Blessed Mother of Lord conceived and gave birth to Christ as a virgin, as hard as, as hard as it is to swallow for some of us, Joseph and her lived as husband and wife and had a family. So here I don't have an objection, but let's continue to the other point. They'd be celibate anyway. The Catholics want them celibate as they're a bunch of molesters and adulterers and everything else. Catholics want them celibate, the uh, Orthodox. Hey, it's false. It's not good for the man to be alone. And this whole idea that Mary Tell remained a virgin, he, Jesus had at least seven half-siblings. It talks Mark about 6, his 3. brother Joseph, his brother James, his brother Judas, and his brother Joseph. And he says, his sisters, are they not all with us? Mark chapter 6. And they'll 6. say, oh, well, that just means cousins. That's just relatives. That's just, but it doesn't use the word brethren in general. It names like his brother. Here's his name, Judas, his brother, James. Not only that, it says, that she knew him not, or that Joseph knew Mary not, yep, Grace, I agree. until she had brought forth her firstborn son. The implication being that after she brought forth her firstborn son, then they knew each other. Okay? Why would she need to remain a virgin? Only if you want to worship her as some kind of a weird virgin goddess like the Babylonians. And it makes sense if you're, if you're into mystery Babylon. Okay? If you want to worship her like a bunch of Hindus bowing down to a female goddess... I'm waiting for the other point. Also, it says that Jesus was the firstborn son. She brought forth her firstborn son in both Luke and Matthew chapter 1. Well, what does that mean? If you have a firstborn son, you have to have a second. If there's a movie called Part 1, you're expecting Part 2. Right? Now, he would need to make this argument stronger. And I think we did a session, right, Christian Princess? It's recorded. And I believe it's... I believe it's... On my YouTube page, where I went in depth responding to a video by a Catholic trying to refute the arguments against the perpetual virginity of Mary. He was responding to the arguments, and I showed why his arguments were weak and unbiblical. Do you remember that, Christian Princess? I know it troubled some of you when I did, and it was recorded, right? And I believe it's on my page, or someone, was it Glory to Thee that recorded it? And posted on his page. Speaking of which, I haven't seen him in a while. I hope he's okay and comes back. We miss him. 
but I'll do another session on it. But he could make his argument stronger for the term firstborn, which appears in Luke 2, 7. But I don't want to do that. This is not my, my focus now. If you want me to do a session, a session on why I am still convinced that our Lord Jesus had biological brothers born of his blessed mother after she gave birth to him as a sexual virgin, meaning she had no intercourse, because her and Joseph lived as husband and wife, I can if you're interested. I can do that next. If you're interested, that's up to you. I can do that the next session, right? That you let me know. But right now, I want to deal with his objection against Mary being the mother of God in the flesh. Okay? So don't leave. Hold on. I know I'm going to offend some of my brothers and sisters in Christ by talking about it, but I, I don't want to be a crowd pleaser, nor do I want to be someone who offends for the sake of offending. Right? I want to be biblical and be gentle as I handle these topics. But almost, he's almost done. So he said, oh, she brought forth her firstborn son, and that's all she ever had. Why didn't they say she brought forth her only son? Or just she brought forth a son? Brought forth a son. Why Why put in that word firstborn? Oh, yeah, that's right. The modern Bibles take out the word firstborn in Matthew 125 to try to hide that. Here's the point I wanted to do. Look at Luke 11. This is the this best is the one. one I want to it just demolishes this. Mariolatry is what it is. Mariolatry. Idolatry directed at Mary. Mariolatry. Look at Luke chapter 11, verse 27. This is the this is powerful. Look at this. Here's the here's the one time in the Bible that somebody venerates Mary. One time. One time. I mean, here we have a billion Catholics. Here we have 300 million Orthodox all venerating Mary. Let's see what Jesus said to someone venerating Mary in the Bible. Watch and by the way, they actually worship her. I'm just using their word. Venerate. And it's true that there's some. Twenty-seven. It came to pass. Let me be clear and honest. It is true that some have taken their devotion to Mary to excesses and ascribed to her attributes and functions that belong only to God. And in that sense, they do worship, even though the Catholic Church officially condemns the worship of any creature. But it is true that you do have among the laity, and even in certain instances, some scholars who have said things about Mary and to Mary that deify her and that is blasphemous and idolatrous may the lord jesus save all of us everyone from that right to respect and love her and cherish her but do not deify her and ascribe to her functions that are true only of god and titles that are true only of god we have to be honest i don't want to offend catholics or orthodox but we have to be honest for the glory of christ this comes from someone who truly loves cherishes and honors mary the mother of my lord as he spake these things a certain woman in the company lifted up her voice. This is the first Catholic, first Orthodox in the Bible. This is the first Orthodox in the Bible. A certain... Chaldean, if I have to take time to show you some of the prayers of Dr. Alphonse Liguri, who wrote a book on the glories of Mary and how blasphemous those prayers are, then you don't really know your own tradition. Do your own homework. I'm not going to do it for you. Sorry to be blunt woman of the company lifted up her voice and said to him blessed is the womb that bear thee and the paps which thou hast sucked but he said yea rather blessed are they that hear the word of god and keep it see right away it was that doctrine that sucked when he said like, oh blessed are the paps that you sucked he's like what kind of a stupid stuff why would he bless the pap that i sucked that makes no sense he's saying no rather blessed is the one who hears god's word and does it and when did God ever tell you to worship Mary? When did God ever tell you to pray to Mary? When did God ever tell you to venerate Mary? So I'd be more blessed if I would just do what God told me to do and stay away from this weird stuff, blessing paps and wombs and everything else. It's not biblical. Okay. But also, Leviathan... Sorry, jump. Okay, now, <clears throat> notice his argument. Jesus said, my mother, brothers, are those who do the will of my Father in heaven. And when a woman in the crowd said, Blessed is the womb who bore you, and blessed are the paps that you suck, meaning the breasts that fed you, the Lord said, Rather, blessed are those who hear the word of God and do it. Now, let's see what happens when you take verses out of context. Number one, even according to his own argument, Mary is truly blessed. Why? Because the same Gospels confirm Mary is one of those who did the will of God and was obedient to God. So let's respond to that. Are you ready? Okay. 
Are you ready now? Chaldean, please do not distract us. Focus on the topic. Focus on the topic, please. Okay. Do you guys understand his objection? Well, the Lord Jesus said, My mother and brothers are those who do the will of God when Mary and his brothers were outside looking for him. And then he quotes Luke 11, 27, 28, where our Lord says to a woman who says, Blessed is the womb that gave you birth, and blessed are the breasts that you suckled from. The Lord said, Rather, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. According to his own argument, Mary is blessed because she's one of those who did do the will of God and did keep God's word. So let's turn his argument against him to show that Mary is truly blessed because she's one of those who heard the word of God and did it. Are you ready? Luke 1. Luke 1, 38. What does Mary say in response to Gabriel? Luke 1, 38. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed, departed from her. Does this sound like Mary heard the word of God through the angel and did it and accepted it? As what God had decreed for her. Now let's look at Luke 1 45. Luke 1 45. Okay. Luke 1 45. Okay. And blessed is she. Elizabeth filled with the Holy Spirit says, Blessed is she that believed. For there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Now, let me ask you this question. Elizabeth, according to Luke 141, was filled with the Holy Spirit. So who inspired Elizabeth telling her to tell Mary she's truly blessed because she believed the word of God and is doing it? So why would you take Luke 11, 27 to 28 out of context? The Lord is clear. What makes Mary blessed is that she heard, accepted God's will for her to be the mother of the Messiah. Right? So why would you take Luke 11, 27, 28 out of context? Now let's read what Mary goes on to say as she breaks out in praise of her Lord and Savior. Luke 1, 46 to 55. Luke 1, 46 to 55. Let's read it. Okay, let's see. Luke 1, 46 to 55. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth, I guess Stephen Anderson didn't note this passage in his King James Bible. From henceforth, all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. Why will they call me blessed? Because of the great things he's done for me by choosing me to be the mother of God in the flesh, giving birth to the Savior of the world. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. Fill me and my daughters with good things, O God. Save us from our calamities in Jesus' name. He hath helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spake to our fathers, Abraham, and to his seed forever. Did everyone get this or no? We fishy. This is Sam Shamoon. Notice we fishy. Lord Almighty, who is this guy? I'm a Christian apologist who writes for Answering Islam, who did a show with David Wood called Jesus or Muhammad, which you can find on YouTube, who writes articles for my blog and the website answeringislam.net or answering-islam.org, who tries to teach regularly on Pal Talk and then archive them for my YouTube page, Shamunian. S-H-A-M-O-U-N-I-A-N. So we fishy. If you feel that the Lord has anointed me to teach, Pray hard for me, my children, and their mother that the blood of Jesus Christ will cover us and save us from attacks of Satan who's trying to attack us to be preserved in the love of Christ forever and to provide for me. So thank you. All right. 
Did you see the response to Steven Anderson? Do you see his objections do not stand up to a closer examination of the Word of God? If that's clear, I'm going to end this session, my response to him, and start another session. Right? Is that clear? To quote Luke 11, 27, 28, or Matthew 12, 47, and ignore what Luke 1 says, right, where Mary herself says, all generations will call her blessed from now on, or where Elizabeth says that she's blessed for believing the fulfillment of what God, the Lord, announced her through Gabriel, or when she tells Gabriel, may it be done to me according to the word of the Lord spoken through you, showing that she heard God's word, believed God's word, trusted God's word, and accepted God's will for her life, ignoring all that to make your case in order to respond to the abuses and excesses of Roman Catholics and Orthodox in their veneration of Mary, that's not being biblical. We don't go to the opposite extreme. We need to maintain biblical balance and be sober-minded and let God's word tell us what to believe, what not to believe, and how to view the Blessed Mother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the fact is, what did the Holy Spirit fill Elizabeth to say in Luke 142? Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Luke 142. What else do you need than the Spirit filling Elizabeth to have her say, Mary is blessed among women in a loud voice because of the fruit of her womb? You need anything else? That was Luke 142. May the Lord Jesus save me from all errors. And I pray I made no mistakes. If I did, may he correct those mistakes in me, not to repeat them, and save you from those, those blunders, blunders and strengthen us in knowing the truth and affirming the truth and living the truth and loving the truth and dying for the truth because the Bible is God truth and God himself is truth. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, please, Father, help us. You know our needs. You know my needs. Please miraculously intervene. Do a miracle in our lives, in the lives of my daughters, their mother. We need a miracle. Save us in the power of the blood of Jesus from attacks of Satan. Father, you know better than anyone else, and I trust in you. Lord Jesus, I trust in you. Holy Spirit, I trust in you. We all trust in you, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good to see you, Jonathan. Don't leave. I'm going to do another live stream in about 10 minutes. I'm going to set it up, Jonathan, talking about the siblings of our Lord. Christ is risen, risen indeed.